Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the MLA Productivity and Profitability webinar series, which has been brought in to include topics on beef, lamb and goats. It's great to have you here tonight. My name is Courtney Cheers, and I work with the webinar coordinators, Holmes Sackett. This series comprises of a total of 30 webinars that will be presented between now and July 2020. These webinars are recorded and can be accessed at a later date. The title of today's webinar is How the Use of Nitrogen in Pastures, which is the second of the two webinars that will be exploring the use of nitrogen in pastures. Richard Eckard from the Melbourne from Melbourne University will be our guest speaker for both presentations. A bit of housekeeping before we get started for those that aren't familiar with the webinar platform or might need a refresh, you'll see the control panel to your right. It's able to be opened and closed using the red arrow. You should be able to hear us, but we can't hear you. So I'd encourage you to use the chat box in the control panel to communicate any questions you have during the presentation. Please make sure your questions are as clear as you can make them so they can be addressed with the relevant responses. When you log out of the webinar tonight, a survey will, will pop up for you to fill out. I'd encourage you all to take the time to fill this out because the feedback we receive from this survey is important to the continuation of the webinar series. It allows us to assess whether we're hitting the right topics for you. So let's kick off the webinar for tonight. Um, I would like to introduce Richard Eckard, who is a professor of livestock production systems at the Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Science at the Melbourne uh, University of Melbourne. His research focuses on the sustainability livestock production and nit nitrogen cycling and loss in grazing systems with a recent focus on carbon farming and options for agriculture to respond to a changing climate. Richard was the author of the original FERT Smart Best Practice Guidelines for Nitrogen Use in Dairy Pastures, which was first published in 1999. He has recently completed a comprehensive analysis to confirm and update the guidelines. We're very fortunate to have Richard presenting this topic tonight. And so with that, I'd like to switch over to Richard's slides. Great. All right, thanks Great, Richard. Thank you. You, can, you can see that, Courtney? Yep, that's great. great. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Courtney, and um, welcome everybody. And um, this is the second part in the uh, series from last week. There'll be just a few overlap slides at the beginning to make sure that um, we're not leaving anyone behind. Um, so those of you who were on last week, last week, it's just a very quick refresher on the first few slides. But what I've tried to do in this one um, is try to pick up on some of the questions that I heard coming through last time and try and fill in some of those blanks. So it, it might not seem quite as um, a flowing story because I'm trying to deal specifically with issues around nitrogen sources, issues around animal health, and issues around ammonia vocalization as some of the topics we will try and touch on tonight. Um, but to refresh where we were um, from last week, we know that all plants need nitrogen for growth. Well, they need a range of nutrients. Um, Generally, the way we work in, in pastures is most of the nutrients we use a soil test and we apply nutrients once or twice a year to address a known deficiency in the soil. Nitrogen does not work like that. You can't get a reliable soil test for nitrogen because it's always coming out of the organic matter. It's coming through the animal. It's a very dynamic nutrient. And so you can do a soil test today. In two weeks time, when you get the test back from the laboratory, well, the whole nitrogen status of the soil has changed by then. So we have to come up with other rules that we can use to know when your pasture is short of nitrogen. Things like urine patches. You can see nitrogen deficiency when urine patches show up because the cows have urinated a large amount of nitrogen or the sheep have. Um, so the way we look at nitrogen is because it's such a dynamic nutrient, um, it can be a very useful man management tool to tactically manipulate seasonal pasture growth as and when you need additional forage. Um, so there are times of the year, like in the peak of the spring, where there's a lot of nitrogen coming out of the legumes. There's a lot of nitrogen that could be coming out of the soil, organic matter. You might not need to boost that pasture with nitrogen. 
whereas in the midwinter or early spring period when soil temperatures are too low nitrogen can be useful but as we learned last week nitrogen too much of it can be a harmful to the environment and wrongly used and incorrectly applied it can be very inefficiently used and uh, we learned last week that some of the responses you can get under poor utilization and poor management of nitrogen you might be better off to go and buy something else so we tend to stick to the rules of nitrogen being the four r's rate source timing placement formulation so the right source at the right rate at the right time and the right place and i've added formulation in there and i'll deal briefly with that tonight it's a more recent one we've brought in to deal with some of these uh, slow release fertilizers or the inhibitor fertilizers or green urea that are designed to reduce losses of nitrogen. So why in particular has this become important this spring? Um, there's two weather events that are happening this spring that mean that there's some uncertainty about what our grass growth potential will be from October onwards. Um, so we know the Indian Ocean Dipole, which is the uh, temperature in the Indian Ocean um, relative to the temperature of Australia it's in what we call a positive phase and you can see the diagram on the right there and in a positive phase it means you have descending cool air off the northwest of Australia which reduces the chance of rain particularly in eastern Australia so that's operating this spring meaning that it's probably a drier than um, average spring period but more recently the Bureau of Meteorology came out with a warning of a sudden stratospheric warming, which is a system, uh, you might remember the polar vortex over the North Pole that froze New York a few years back, I think. Um, this is the same thing in the South Pole, a natural phenomenon that means the temperatures over in the upper atmosphere of the South Pole are now much hotter than they should be. And what that does is intensifies the trade winds, the westerlies coming across the country, pulling the cold fronts closer to the poles, and it means that actually there's a decreased chance of um, late spring summer rain. They seem to say that Tasmania might get colder and wetter and that New South Wales and Southern Queensland will get drier as a result um, from October through to about January. Um, so I guess I mentioned both of these because the window of opportunity in Southeastern Australia to grow as much grass as possible might be only the next four weeks, which means Let's try and get as much growth as possible. And how do we do that? Well, we use the soil moisture we've got, we use the rainfall we've got with the increasing temperatures we've got, use a bit of nitrogen fertilizer in that mix and you will increase the growth rate of the pasture. So last week we uh, went through the theory of nitrogen use and um, right at the beginning, I must explain that this is a typical nitrogen response curve for the amount of nitrogen applied in a single grazing cycle, and I talk of N per hectare, not urea, because urea is roughly double that. Um, so we talk of N, um, and we'll come to a reason why later. But I call this utopia, because it's Elliott Research Station on a Krasnozem soil in spring um, under almost perfect perennial ryegrass growing conditions. So don't take this as what you can do on every property. This is almost the ideal. And you can see that as you increase the nitrogen fertilizer rate on the x-axis you can see there's a steep increase in the growth rate of the pasture if you follow that red line but the law of diminishing returns kicks in which is you get to a point somewhere as you apply more and more nitrogen higher rates of nitrogen you get to a point where you've satiated the soil plant system's capacity to use that nitrogen in that particular growth cycle and so in this particular case, that was at about 62 kilograms of nitrogen. You'll see that we've got the maximum growth identified there. So Y max, you'll see that's the 100% of, of potential growth rate and just so happens to be 100 kilos a day. Well, nobody puts on 143 kilos of nitrogen. That's ridiculous because once you start getting on the flat part of the curve, you might get very small increases in the growth rate, but you're not doing it very efficiently. So we pull it back to say the maximum amount of nitrogen in this scenario you should apply shouldn't be more than 62 kilo, kilograms of nitrogen where you will get 90% of the potential that you could have got um, and, you, and you stayed on the steep part of the curve. So if we look at what we should be doing, 
when we talk of nitrogen use efficiency and we say you can get 10 kilograms of extra dry matter for every one kilogram of nitrogen you invest, um, what we're talking about is how steep is that portion of the curve? In other words, how many extra kilograms of dry matter are pushed by every in increment in nitrogen fertilizer? In this particular case, because it's utopia, it's the best growing conditions you could imagine for perennial ryegrass under ideal conditions, we would probably be, that slope would probably be 20 to 1. Um, so we work on an average of 10 to 1 across a range of conditions, but it can be much higher and much lower than that. So now before you get intimidated by a whole bunch of graphs thrown at you, there's a storyline that I want to get out of this rather than the individual detail. So I might just take a bit of time to explain what we're looking at and then tell you a narrative, a story around what this tells us. So if you look across the top, you can see in each column, we've got a different site from Ellen Bank in West Gippsland, Elliott Research Station in Tasmania, Mount Gambia in South Australia under irrigated conditions, Tari in New South Wales, which is summer rainfall, no irrigation there, and Tarang in Western Victoria. Um, and what we've got here is a nitrogen response curve that we put through our model that is showing you the shape of the response curve to increasing rates of nitrogen. So if you look at the across the horizontal axis, you'll see 0, 30, 60, 90. We're not recommending people ever apply up to 120, 150. We're trying to demonstrate a point here. Um, and so that's the amount of nitrogen applied in each of these instances. And so if you go from top to bottom, the first row is winter responses, next spring responses, next summer responses, and next autumn responses. And we've used a thing called box plots here. And box plots, if you look at the ones that expand out a bit, the middle line is the average that you get at that particular response. The gray box shows you what you get in 75 to 25% of the years that we looked at, because this is 20 years worth of average responses in each case. And then the tails you see on each of those are the extremes. So what does 10% of the years look like and what do 90% of the years look like? So when you look at these graphs, think of the middle line as the average and the shape of the response. But also think of the tails as being some signal that there's some uncertainty, that there are some years that fail. So I'll tell the story now. Um, if you look at winter at Elamang, top left graph, you can see a predictable response to nitrogen, but it doesn't go as high as that Elliott graph I showed you previously. It goes to about 30 kilos of nitrogen, then curves over. That says you probably don't want to put more than 30 on in the middle of winter at Elamang. But if you go across to Elliott, same similar story there, because it's quite cool in Tasmania. But note that the bands are quite narrow compared to the graphs below. So winter rainfall is very predictable, very reliable. Temperatures are very predictable and reliable. So the variation between 20 years worth of response curves is quite small. You get a very predictable response to nitrogen through the winter months at these locations. Similar at Mount Gambia. At Tari, you get a far better response because it's warmer and it's annual ryegrass in that case. The others are perennial ryegrass. So annual ryegrass is more vigorous in responding to nitrogen, and you can see it at Tari, warmer temperatures in New South Wales, but also a, a more responsive species. And then Tarang, you'll see there's a little bit broader in the box plots. So the top to bottom is a bit wider, a little bit more uncertainty in Western Victoria because it's slightly less certain in winter rainfall than Ellen Lake. In the second row, you start seeing some very impressive responses in spring if you just look across. Um, you see that Ellen Bank, for example, um, good responses to nitrogen, responses to a higher rate of nitrogen as well. So you're starting to see uh, a response up to 50 kilos of nitrogen in spring there. But some years fail. And we know that. Last spring, for example, was a good year to, not a good year, it was a bad year, um, where we didn't get much rain at Ellen Bank to get that response until about November. So there are some years where you get less of a response, but you always get a response to nitrogen. Utopia that I showed you, which is Elliott Research Station in spring, so that's two in, two down. Um, very tight response, very predictable response year in, year out. Mount Gambia, a bit of temperature issues coming through there that means some years aren't as good as others. Tari, very good response in annual ryegrass in spring. Tarang, looking a bit more like Ellen Bank. You can get some failed springs. If we go to the summer responses, we would expect some very different outcomes here. At Ellenbank, you can get very few, you can get some summers, 
where you get rain all the way through summer. Um, it is not common. And so you've got the average down the bottom flat response to nitrogen and only occasional years where the tails creep up and you get that wet summer where you can get a response to nitrogen. We don't recommend nitrogen generally under those conditions. Elliott Research Station next door, because it's irrigated, it's in Tasmania, it's much cooler. Under irrigation, you can get great grass growth of perennial ryegrass and great responses to nitrogen. Mount Gambia, even though it's irrigated, you can get some heat stress problems in summer, even though it's got center pivot irrigator in this particular situation, perennial ryegrass doesn't like those hot conditions, so you get more variable responses in hot summers versus dry summers. Um, Taree, again, because it's New South Wales, that's, that's an oversown annual ryegrass with Kaikuyu, and you can get boom or bust in summer with Kaikuyu because you can get some summer storms, give you a great response to nitrogen, or you could have a dry summer where the storms don't arrive and no response to nitrogen, very uncertain without irrigation. And Tarang looking more like Ellen Bank. The autumn's the one that I wanted to highlight because if you look generally across that whole row, a lot of the autumn responses are far less impressive. And that's one thing that's come out of our recent research where we've shown that at Ellen Bank, so the first column, bottom left-hand corner, and Tarang, bottom right-hand corner, you can get some years in autumn where you get a good response to nitrogen because it's followed up, it's following a wet summer. But most years when you get to the autumn break, there's just simply not enough water in the soil, there's not enough soil moisture to get a response to nitrogen. And we just say rather wait until late April, May, when you know you've got some soil moisture, you know you've got uh, growth, there's enough moisture for follow-up rains and you can get a response to nitrogen. So I hope you got the story out of there. There's just a general picture of how soil moisture, soil temperature, season all interact to give you different reasons why nitrogen would respond at different times of the year. Um, what else limits the response to nitrogen? This is one of the questions that came up last time. Um, how do you know you're gonna get a good response to nitrogen? Well, we know that basal nutrition, if other nutrients are limiting, like phosphorus, for example, um, if your phosphorus is limiting, your olsen peas or coal peas are limiting, it just brings the whole response to nitrogen down. So, for example, the graph on the right, you'll see response to nitrogen fertilizer, where you've got a high olsen P, um, and the response below, it doesn't mean you don't get a response to nitrogen. You can still get a response to nitrogen with a lower olsen P. It's just not as impressive as you would have got had you got a high olsen P. So the rule there is, if you have low olsen P, you can get a response to nitrogen. You could think of putting DAP on instead, in other words, diammonium phosphate to provide the phosphorus as well as the nitrogen and boost that response. Or you could say, well, if I have a, a different paddocks on the farm, some have got a higher olsen P and some have got a lower olsen P. If the high olsen P has a higher ryegrass content, you could get a better response by putting all your nitrogen on there rather than spreading it across the whole farm. The other one to remember is in the middle of winter or in the early spring period, north facing slopes are always warmer in soil temperature than south facing slopes. So if you had a choice and you say, well, I'm desperate for feed in the first week of July, second week of July, you might actually want to focus on the north facing slopes and then in August focus on the other slopes to get a better average response. Soil moisture we've touched on already. There's no point in putting on nitrogen if the actual soil moisture can't sustain the extra growth that you're looking for. So know what your soil moisture is, it's vital. And know that you've got adequate soil moisture for the extra response you need. And species composition we've kind of touched on. We saw on the previous graph that at Tari, annual ryegrass is far more vigorous in responding to nitrogen. Perennial ryegrass is very good. It's just slightly behind annual ryegrass in its response to nitrogen. And then the other species like fescue, coxfoot, Valerius, not as aggressive as perennial ryegrass, but still respond well. But if you have a paddock full of fog grass, you probably wouldn't bother with nitrogen um, putting on that. Um, so target the more responsive species, the better fertilized paddocks and the warmer paddocks in winter. There were questions around nitrogen source and we've tested a whole range of sources of nitrogen. And you can see the graph on the right, urea, in this case, calcium ammonium nitrate, which is the same as limestone ammonium nitrate, different products, ammonium sulfate. And as long as you, and, and what we've got there is different seasons and different sites. So three sites and two seasons at each site. 
And you can see if you stick within each of the three groupings of bars, there's actually no dry matter yield response difference between all those sources of nitrogen as long as they applied at the same elemental rate. And that's really important in this conversation because urea is 46% nitrogen and diamonium phosphate is only 18% nitrogen, but it's 20% phosphorus. And um, other sources of nitrogen have got different um, nitrogen contents in them. So remember though, that if you only need nitrogen fertilizer, if you only need N nitrogen, then urea is always the cheapest pure source of nitrogen. Um, you might get a small amount of ammonia loss from urea, but it's usually less than 10% of the total uh, between May and November. So after the autumn break, until the season dries out and warms up, uh, generally the ammonia losses we've measured, and I'll show you data in the next few slides, the ammonia losses are less than 10%, and that is less than the price difference between urea and any other form of nitrogen. So it still means even with that 10%, urea is still the cheapest source of nitrogen. In summer, the ammonia losses can be higher from urea. I'll show you some data on that as well. But we would argue that following best practice, if the soil is too dry and the temperatures are too high, you, unless you've got irrigation, you would not be applying nitrogen in those dry summer months. And so that loss is probably not on, according to best practice anyway. If you do need phosphorus as well as nitrogen, then we would say the cheapest mix source of nitrogen and phosphorus is going to be diammonium phosphate. Um, and you can get your phosphorus as well as your, your, your urea. Now, because we recommend that the rate of urea shouldn't be below 20 kilos of nitrogen in any per hectare in any single application, because below that the responses are quite uncertain and shouldn't be above about 50 kilos of nitrogen in any application, because above that again, it becomes very uncertain. If you only apply two bags of diammonium phosphate to the hectare and you, 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 you're getting too low a rate of nitrogen in the mix. And so what we would suggest, instead of just putting on DAP on its own at two bags per hectare, if that's the recommended phosphorus you need, to get the nitrogen response up within the 20 to 50, we would throw a bag of urea in with the two bags of DAP, just to make sure you've got a reliable response to nitrogen and you're not wasting that nitrogen. Now, people are concerned about ammonia volatilization um, from urea in particular. Um, and so I thought I'd deal with that. Um, what happens is the ammonia goes up uh, into the atmosphere as small particles, and it pretty much comes down with the dust or with rain uh, averaged over the district. Uh, now, not a lot of nitrogen comes down in the rain. If you go to the Netherlands, where they use a lot of nitrogen in agriculture, and there's a lot of piggeries around, there's a lot of dairy properties, you can get 50 to 80 kilos of nitrogen out of the rainfall in a year in the Netherlands. That doesn't happen in Australia. What we've measured is somewhere in dairy country, we've measured somewhere between five and eight kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year from deposition out of the ammonia in the atmosphere. Not enough to make any difference. So don't rely on that. Even lightning storms don't deposit uh, significant amounts of nitrogen. Um, but if you look at the season of the year, and we, we were talk, talking earlier um, about some of the measurements we've done um, on ammonia loss, from the autumn break to November, I said usually it's below 10%. Our measurements at, in Gippsland would suggest over a number of seasons, somewhere between 3 and 6% of the urea nitrogen may go off depending on the conditions. Um, so you don't need to adjust your management to accommodate that. You don't need to water urea into the soil in that time of the year. Urea is hygroscopic. It actually will suck moisture out of the surrounding environment and dissolve itself. It has enough moisture between the autumn break and November to dissolve itself. It'll be gone by the next morning. Um, if you look at the summer months, as I said, the losses can be higher. If you're applying it under hotter conditions, you can lose more uh, between six and 14%. The maximum we've ever recorded where we tried to actually deliberately create conditions in the middle of February, highly evaporative conditions. I'll show you some data in the next few slides. We managed to push that loss as high as 25% by doing everything we would consider to be wrong, according to best practice. So if you do apply during the hotter months, um, not really recommended unless there's good rainfall or there's irrigation. Urea is still the cheapest source of nitrogen. And um, even though the DAP, for example, doesn't lose much as ammonia. This is an experiment I thought I'd show you just to emphasize the point. So 
re-emphasizing that during the from the autumn break to November you really don't need to wash nitrogen into the soil uh, and ammonia losses are not an issue. If you were applying nitrogen during the hotter drier period of the year we ran this experiment in the middle of February in West Gippsland trying to create conditions that might maximize ammonia loss and so we had a control treatment the treatment on the left in three different years where you can see 50 kilograms of nitrogen applied in the middle of February with no rain at all and it varied between zero which was a wet February through to a very dry hot February where we lost 13 percent of the urea in that application so I'm showing this as an extreme example we then had two scenarios one where we said do we trust the uh, weather report or do we not trust the weather report so the one where we trusted the weather report we said well we'll put out the urea and then assume we either get five millimeters of rain on top of that or 20 millimeters of rain on top of that and you can see five millimeters of rain we got between seven and ten percent loss so it didn't make it worse to have some rain on top of the urea it didn't make it worse than doing nothing 20 millimeters of rain on top of the urea we had absolutely no loss it washed it into the soil and it elimin eliminated the volatilization loss now this is the only part to remember out of this graph is that um, that second batch of treatments there called delay um, and um, so you look at the control treatment the second set of set of columns is delay what we mean by that is middle of the dry hot February period we didn't trust the weather report we waited for 25 millimeters 20 millimeters of rain to come and the next morning we went out under hot evaporative drying conditions and we spread urea on the ground and we lost up to 21 percent of that urea so that's what we would consider to be the worst case scenario that you can create is putting nitrogen fertilizer after a rain in the middle of the hot dry February you can get 21 percent loss we have some experiments that say it could be up to 30 percent but that would be a, a, an extreme case so you can usually manage ammonia volatilization and this is this is an example of how it changes through the year where we measured either the green bars in each season not putting any nitrogen on so actually we had deposition of, of, of ammonia from the atmosphere onto those treatments we used ammonium nitrate and there wasn't much loss at all um, but in spring and summer there was a bit because of the animals that had grazed that had deposited urine which is largely urea um, and then the uh, the urea that we used and you can see the losses from each application there um, roughly because we put on 50 kilos of nitrogen in each case you just double the figure on the x-axis so about five kilos of nitrogen lost in autumn um, about four in the middle of winter from the application of 50 and you can see the effect of applying nitrogen in the summer so that really told us that if you stick to the best practices of applying nitrogen in the cool part of the year um, ammonia loss is not really a big issue however if you do get yourself stuck and you say well this sudden stratospheric warming that's coming in spring if we know we've got enough soil moisture it's now October we know we've got a full profile but the hot weather has arrived we've got a 35 degree day we really want to get a response to nitrogen how do we manage that risk that it could be lost you could think of applying nitrogen three days before grazing rather than at grazing I'll explain this um, the graph on the right shows you the time the, the loss of ammonia from a urea granule over time and what you'll see there's not much loss from the time you apply for about the first 24 hours and that's because in that time the urea granule sitting on the soil surface it's coated with um, resin and is formaldehyde treated and it takes about the first 12 hours for the urea granule to dissolve that coating the resin coating and for moisture to get in and to dissolve it then you have this period where the actual urea starts having to convert from urea into ammonia because ammonia is what the plant needs to grow it can't grow on urea and that urea molecule breaks down and during that time what we call hydrolysis the urea granule generates a very alkaline pH just around the granule and it's at those alkaline pHs that it creates ammonia gas from itself now that only lasts for about 12 to 48 hours and you can see the dramatic drop at about 48 hours after which there's not much loss of ammonia from the granule so we were presenting this to a group of farmers and one farmer said well what happens if we put the urea on three days before grazing and that whole event of hydrolysis is all finished by the time we put the cows in and we tested that and we found that it actually works pretty well 
So if you are concerned and it's hot, dry weather and you do need to put on nitrogen fertilizer, you want to try and manage the loss of ammonia, you can choose to put it on three days before grazing, have the longer grass actually protect the urea granules. So you can imagine that with a short grass on the, the, in the example on the right there, the wind can actually take away that ammonia loss and increase its loss. The longer grass on the left is actually sheltering wind from getting to that ammonia granule and it traps the ammonia in the canopy of the plant, reducing the amount that's lost. So we actually used that and showed that you could take a 10% loss down to about a Im immeasurable, down to about 1% loss by just applying three days before grazing. I emphasize that that's not needed for most of the year. When you're applying after the autumn break under cooler temperatures through to about October, probably not needed. The other loss you can get is um, from denitrification. This is a process in warm and waterlogged conditions. So you can see straight away on the right there, the summer months, no difference between three sources of nitrogen, um, really not a large loss at all. But under wet conditions in the middle of winter, if you did happen to use a nitrate-based fertilizer, you might lose more. So some of the liquids, for example, you wouldn't want to use them under wet conditions in the middle of winter because you will get more loss through denitrification than you will from an ammoniated source like urea. So a simple message there, watch out for the wet winters. Um, and even in the wet winter period, stick with urea because it's a better and safer source to use than any other source. Nitrate leaching is the other risk of, of loss. Um, and I'll emphasize here that while there's a difference between sources of nitrogen, um, you can see three consecutive years of cumulative nitrate leaching here. And obviously in putting on no nitrogen fertilizer, the green dotted line in those three consecutive years didn't show um, a lot of difference between that and urea only. So if you put on conservative amounts of urea, we're not showing a big increase in nitrate leaching. But if you did put on a nitrate based fertilizer, like some of the liquids in the middle of winter or in autumn, you can increase the loss of nitrogen from that source. Now, touching a bit on nitrogen formulation, um, we do have a number of different products on the market that um, uh, you, you might encounter, uh, particularly with the uh, whole carbon farming, carbon neutral uh, discussion we're having, reducing the emissions of nitrous oxide from nitrogen fertilizers. There are these inhibitor products out there like DMPP or NTEC, it may be called, Entrench or nitropyrin, and a product called EcoN um, DCD. I've got a question mark there because it's banned currently, but it's about to come back on the market. It was banned for the wrong reason, um, but and I can explain that later if you want, but it will become a product again in the near future. These products keep all the nitrogen in the ammonium form and don't allow it to become nitrate because nitrate is what moves with water. So if you have leaching happening, if you have drainage happening, if you have denitrification happening, you don't want the nitrogen in the nitrate form. They'll keep it in the ammonium form. We've done a lot of work on these products and I'll show you some data in a moment to say there's not a strong case to use them uh, as a coating on fertilizer at this stage, mainly because they don't give you a productivity benefit. I'll show you in a moment. There are other products called urease inhibitors and this is green urea or agrotane treated urea, um, product name NBPT. There are occasions where this could be cost effective and thinking of that scenario I painted earlier where you've come into October, this warming event has happened, you've got 30 degree days now at an unnatural time of the year. So you've got high temperatures, high ammonia loss, but you've got a soil profile full of water. You really want that loss and you're worried about ammonia loss then you can use a product like Agrotain. But I would caution you to say, if you use a product like Agrotain, don't go in at the same rate as you would have on urea. Because you'd say, well, if I was going to put on 50 kilos of nitrogen as urea, and we know Agrotain's probably going to reduce the ammonia loss by 20%, well, you'd cut the rate back commensurately to account for that reduction in loss. You wouldn't put it on at the same rate. Because in all our experiments, that's where we find there's no yield advantage. There's only an advantage to you if you buy a product like that and you cut the rate back because you're compensating for the reduced loss. Polymer-coated ureas, you'll see these on the market. 
we don't think they have a long future simply because the European Union is banning them because of microplastics, because they are based on microplastic products. There is, there are other products coming through that are not, that are also slow release products that are not um, uh, microplastic based. So watch the market for those as they come through, they may be worth looking at. Here's the problem with using these enhanced efficiency fertilizers. What I mean by that is either nitrification inhibitor fertilizers or um, uh, urease uh, inhibited fertilizers. And you can see an experiment conducted by a colleague of mine where we compared a urea in the second column. First column, we didn't put any nitrogen on. And this is the dry matter yield response or the annual um, biomass yield. Urea at a given rate compared to a polymer coated urea, compared to the DMPP nitrification inhibitor, compared to the green urea, which reduces ammonia loss. And you really can't pick a difference in the dry matter yield response between those products. Um, so the green urea in this particular case isn't giving you any advantage by using it as a regular product. As I come back to the earlier story, if you have an extreme case where you think there is a high risk and you really want to go ahead with nitrogen, you can use it as a one-source product and there will be an advantage if you cut the rate, but not if you apply it at the same rate as everything else and use it regularly. I hope that's clear. There were some questions last time about ammonia, uh, about um, uh, animal health implications. And there is a risk of uh, spring nitrogen uh, in leading to uh, nitrate toxicity. Let me emphasize that nitrate toxicity is really an issue of moving animals from a low plane of nitrogen nutrition suddenly to a high plane of nutrition. So be careful about that as the, as the major component. Don't go from a, uh, a, a low fertilized, low poor species composition paddock with low crude protein and put the animals straight into a paddock that's got lush spring annual ryegrass fertilized heavily with nitrogen. That you're looking for trouble right from the beginning. And you can see on the graph on the right, some work we did looking at the pattern of nitrate accumulation post nitrogen fertilizer application. And you can see that nitrate doesn't accumulate initially up till about day five to seven. Then you get a rapid accumulation of nitrate in the plant, the dotted line, um, up to about day 14. And then it rapidly drops in its nitrate through to about day 18 to 21 as the plant grows and builds crude protein. So you can see the crude protein graph increase to about day 25, somewhere around there. Um, and so that's why we say when you're using nitrogen fertilizer on a highly responsive species in spring, where you can get the maximum amount of nitrate uptake, um, don't put the cows or the sheep into the paddock within that day seven to about 18 window. If you're gonna do that, if you're gonna go on a shorter rotation, cut back the rate of nitrogen commensurately. So uh, just a, a few notes on that. There are some species that are known to accumulate nitrate and they would be annual ryegrass at the top of the list. Short rotation ryegrass as well. Uh, I must emphasize that perennial ryegrass is not known to accumulate toxic levels of nitrate. We've never seen it. It's not classified as a nitrate accumulating species. Cape weed is known to accumulate nitrate and volunteer brassicas from last year's crop that just pop up in your pasture this year, they can accumulate high levels of nitrate as well. Um, so be, be aware of the species difference um, and uh, species like tall fescue, species like um, your annual and perennial poa, uh, species like phalaris don't accumulate high levels of nitrate either. There is a risk of ammonia toxicity or ammonia bloat, which we call it, um, where an animal might have too high a crude protein level as well. And you usually pick that up by seeing small scalding spots in the paddock. And it's usually only at the peak of spring when there's a lot of soil nitrogen being liberated out of the soil organic matter. The plants are taking up a lot of the nitrogen. If you put nitrogen fertilizer on top of that uh, peak amount of nitrogen, you can get a very high crude protein content in the pasture particularly again with annual ryegrass, um, where those levels can go up as high as 30% or above. Again, perennial ryegrass struggles to get protein levels above 25%, so not as much of a problem. And then finally, probably um, a note to end on is um, nitrogen regulation. I often get asked this question, how long can we keep doing what we're doing? Uh, 
And we know that Australia is the only developed country in the world that still doesn't have formal regulations on nitrogen fertilizer use on farm. Um, do we take comfort out of that or concern? We know that there is legislation being prepared in Queensland for the sugar industry and the barrier reef. Um, and there are discussions in the dairy industry in Victoria about regulation at some stage. Um, and we see plenty of examples around the world where there is regulation on nitrogen use. So the common European agricultural, the EU common agricultural policy, the European Union nitrates directive sits under that. The miners system in the Netherlands, the mineral nutrient and accounting system has been in place for at least 25, if not 30 years. Um, a lot written around that about how farmers have undermined the system because they don't actually own the process. Um, nitrate vulnerable zones in the UK, and you can see the farmers very excited about Brexit um, being able to renegotiate those out of the EU. Um, a lot written about Chesapeake Bay and New York's water supply. And we've seen most regional councils in New Zealand now regulate nitrogen fertilizer use. The graph on the right just shows you the impact that nitrogen fertilizer um, nutrient regulations in the European Union had when they came in in the 90s. You can see a, that drop down and a fairly stable position after that. Um, so these policies have had an impact. Um, I will end off by saying that when we talk about nitrogen fertilizer and we're saying be very strategic, you only apply nitrogen fertilizer as and when you need extra growth on the farm and you certainly don't recommend applying it following animals in every grazing rotation 12 months of the year. And that's where places like the Netherlands have got into trouble where they've actually defaulted into a recipe of applying nitrogen following as the animals leave a paddock, they go in with a, a dose of nitrogen 12 months of the year. That's where you run into trouble. Um, so the way we've written the third smart guidelines about very tactical use of nitrogen coming in as and when you need extra growth rate in perhaps the autumn just before going into winter and in the early spring period to boost growth or in a special case like this spring where you're saying we might not have grass after October so let's get a better growth rate. Um, that falls well within the guidelines and would not contravene any of these uh, global regulations. So um, that's uh, the presentation and I'll hand it back to Courtney. Thanks Richard, that was great. Some um, really good points that you put across and also probably clearing up a few misconceptions that people might have had about um, nitrogen use. Just want to say before we get into some questions, um, if you have to duck off early, just don't forget to fill out the survey um, as you exit. It's very important to um, the webinar series it's shared with MLA and the presenters to improve extension efforts and make sure that we're um, hitting the right topics and also the delivery is, um, is on point. So I'm going to get into a few questions. People have already sent through some, but if you didn't hear at the start, feel free to send them through using the chat box in your control panel. So the first question I've got is, is there a correlation between nitrogen uh, response and organic matter levels? Sorry. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, it's all organic matter levels. Um, yeah, uh, general rule is the higher the soil organic matter content of a soil, the more nitrogen will come out of that soil organic matter. Um, so we, we talk on, uh, uh, in principle, that total organic nitrogen, about 1% of that becomes available per year. Um, the difference can be that if you've got high soil organic matter soils with a high amount of nitrogen stored in that organic matter, you can get 300 kilograms of nitrogen released out of that organic matter in a 12 month period. That can go as low as 50. If you've got a very sandy soil with not much organic matter in, you can only get 50 out of that. So it makes a big difference. Where it plays out is in that first big bunch of graphs I showed you. If you can think of those responses at different times of the year, you've got to remember that most of that organic matter turnover happens during the wetter, warmer part of the year. So you get a lot of it coming out in spring and not much coming out in the cold, wet winter period. So we say with strategic nitrogen, the reason why we're saying put it on in late autumn, perhaps in winter and maybe in spring, is that's when you're getting the least delivery out of the organic matter of organic nitrogen. You wouldn't really want to fight with that organic nitrogen in the spring or in the autumn period 
when it's delivering a fair bit of nitrogen into the system. Yeah, right. thanks, Richard. Um, Bruce has asked, and he's not sure if you did cover it last week, do you have a graph on dry matter response to nitrogen over time? How long does the increased dry matter occur um, post nitrogen application? Yeah, so good question, and we didn't deal with it last time. Um, because nitrogen is quite a slippery element and water is the main reason why nitrogen doesn't hang around, during the wetter part of the year, so we're talking about the wet months in, you know, from the autumn break, perhaps June, July, maybe August, um, nitrogen doesn't hang around long. So if you put on nitrogen for one grazing rotation, usually there's not much of a carryover effect into the next grazing rotation. So we, we tend to advise you think about just the nitrogen you need for that one grazing rotation because there's so much water around that whatever's not taken up by the plant in the first 14 days is pretty much gone and it's lost in one waterborne process or another. When you come into the spring period, say September, October, November, where things have dried out a bit, higher rates of nitrogen can usually show a carryover effect into the next grazing rotation of about 20 to 25 percent of the initial response you got. So definitely there too, um, the major response you get is in the first grazing rotation after the nitrogen is applied, so the first regrowth period after the nitrogen is applied. But because there's not a lot of waterborne processes that time of year leaching down through the soil, there could be some nitrogen hanging and you can get about a 20% carryover into the next grazing rotation. Yeah, all right. Thanks, Richard. Um, I've got a question from Nick and um, I know we've covered the different types of um, nitrogen forms that you can use and, and whether there's any benefit to the different types. But Nick's asked, is there any benefit in using urea as a foliar spray? Yeah. Um, look, up until recently, I would have said no, and probably the answer is still no, um, because the, the plant actually doesn't have a substantial mechanism to take up nitrogen or urea through the leaves. There is some evidence. The reason why I hesitate, there is some limited evidence, and Bill Fulkerson in um, Wollongba is uh, busy doing an experiment looking at foliar application of urea. Um, and so I'm waiting for those results to come through because we had a big discussion around this. There is some evidence that liquid urea in very small amounts can be taken up straight through the plant leaf. Um, it doesn't appear to be enough of an uptake across the leaf to result in a substantial nitrogen response. Where people get a bit bluffed is that a foliar application can often green up a forage. So you can spray it on lettuce and see that lettuce is greener as a result. That's because there's an instant response on that very small amount of nitrogen that goes through the leaf into the plant. But it, when you measure it in terms of additional dry matter yield response, you often can't pick that up because it's only a very small amount of nitrogen that transported across the leaf. So even liquid sources of nitrogen are actually fertilizing the soil because the soil is your best mechanism through the roots to actually suck up large amounts of nitrogen into the plant. Um, so, yes, foliar can green up a pasture, um, but it's a very temporary response and usually can't result in a measurable dry matter yield response. Mm. Well, that's interesting. Thanks, Richard. Andrew has asked, is there a rule of thumb to determine the amount of nitrogen required per kilogram dry matter growth rate? Um, we, we, we have a number of lookup tables that I can point you to um, that, uh, that we published that give you some idea of um, different times of the year. You, you, you can use growth rate as a surrogate um, and say that in the middle of winter when your growth rate is 10 kilos of dry matter a day, um, applying nitrogen, as long as temperature is not severely limiting growth, applying nitrogen could take that 10 up to about 18 kilos of dry matter. Um, that's the potential. In the peak of spring where you're growing, say, 60 kilos of dry matter a day, it's illogical to think that nitrogen can double that. It'll probably pick it up another 20%, but that's a big 20%. Um, so we, we tend to think more in terms of during the period of the year when the pasture can grow. If your growth rate's low, nitrogen can, can almost double it. If your growth rate is high, nitrogen can probably pick it up another 20%. I don't know if that answers the question, but that's, 
in the absence of a soil test, um, there's, there's growth rate is probably your best surrogate measure of the kind of response you can get to nitrogen. Yeah, right. Thanks, Richard. Just a bit of a follow-on question. Is it possible for you to summarise um, the conditions under which you would expect less than five kilograms of dry matter per unit of N and the conditions at which you can expect more? Yeah, okay. Um, so, so you could imagine, for example, in northern Victoria in the second week of July, where you've got a fair few heavy frosts happening, um, soil temperatures below five degrees centigrade in the middle of winter. Um, there's plenty of moisture around, or enough moisture around, but temperature and soil temperature in particular is really limiting growth. Under those conditions, if you put on nitrogen fertilizer, you wouldn't expect a, a, a decent response to nitrogen. You'd probably expect about less than five to one response. If you go to the other extreme and you're saying middle of February in, um, uh, in Hamilton, for example, um, middle of February, you've had a dry summer. Um, there's some moisture around, you're down on the bottom land, uh, black soils. There's some deep soil moisture around, so the grass is still green, but it's not growing very actively. Putting nitrogen under those conditions, you probably get less than a five to one response as well. Um, where you get the maximum response, is if you in the third week of July through to about the end of August, early September, um, you've got increasing day length, you've got uh, warming soil temperature. So the soil temperature it might be low at the start, but it's actually increasing over the regrowth period. You've got good fertility, good species composition. You've had good rain, um, as I said, increasing temperatures. Under those peak spring growing conditions, um, you could probably get, we've, we've measured as high as 30 to 1 response in annual ryegrass, probably about 26 to 1 response in perennial ryegrass, 22 response to 1 in tall fescue, for example. Yeah, right. Yeah. Thanks, Richard. Um, Patrick has asked the question, how does chicory um, and plantain specifically uh, respond to nitrogen applications in September or October? Could there be any animal health issues with um, nitrogen and these pasture species. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I, I will I will start with the disclaimer that I have never done any work on nitrogen response in plantain or chicory. Um, the, as far as I understand, um, they both can accumulate some nitrate in them, um, and I would be a little cautious about putting too much nitrogen on them in spring. Um, because both of, both of them, uh, as far as I understand, can accumulate some, some level of nitrate. They're not known to be as bad as capeweed or brassicas, but they are known to accumulate some nitrogen. So I would probably still fertilize them, but go on the lower end of the nitrogen rate, so 20 to 30 kilos of nitrogen, and then wait probably four to five weeks before grazing them after that. Yeah, right. Thanks, Richard. Um, and just John has asked a question just for everyone's um, interest. Will the webinar be available to view later? Yes, we do record all the webinars uh, and currently we don't have a, a website where we can post the links. And so if you email me, Courtney at homesacket.com.au, which should be on your webinar um, information page, then I can provide you with the link. So. Um, yeah, feel free to email me tomorrow if you'd like a copy of the webinar from tonight and from uh, previous weeks as well. Um, Richard, I just have another question. You listed um, in your slides, which is quite good, the, um, the points that you need to get right when you're applying nitrogen. And I'm not sure whether it's possible to, to list them in order of priority, but um, you know, is there something that is of utmost importance that if we had to compromise on other factors, we should make sure we get that one right? Um, can everyone still see the screen? I thought I'd go back to that. Just is that that's the yeah. one we were talking about? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Um, look, looking looking through those, um, I would say uh, if you are in central to northern Victoria, temperature in winter is going to be your biggest limitation. 
Um, so you'd really want to know you've got soil temperatures that are adequate to get a response to nitrogen. Um, soil moisture I'd put really high on the list at the margins of the season. I wouldn't put it high on the list in the middle of the season. So once you've had the autumn break and the soil is filled up with water, between there and October when it might start drying out, soil moisture is probably not the big issue. Um, so that kind of leaves temperature, species composition and basal nutrition as the issues. Um, I would say that species composition and basal nutrition are connected because usually the paddock that's got the better species composition has a species composition like that because it's got better basal nutrients anyway. Um, so targeting the better species composition, um, you can compensate for the lack of basal nutrition by actually putting on diammonium phosphate as your source of phosphorus and nitrogen and get a decent response to nitrogen as long as the species composition is there. So probably if you're in the coast, soil temperature is never a limitation. If you're within sort of Hamilton and south, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say soil temperature is even an issue, but north of the dividing range, it can be a big severe limitation in winter. That would be the biggest one. But apart from that, species composition, targeting the higher, more responsive species is always going to pay, pay back better. Yeah, okay, no, thank you for that, Richard. Um, John has asked a question, how much nitrogen is lost in a really big um, rainfall event runoff? Yeah, so, so in, a, um, in, a, in a single rainfall event, the amount of nitrogen lost is, is not so much through leaching as it is through surface runoff. Um, so if you've actually got water flowing over the surface, it can pick up about 10% of the nitrogen and take it off. That's the sort of figures, the highest level figures we've got of how much runs off as opposed to, because the initial rain that comes down is going to wash the nitrogen in and whatever runs on the surface will actually pick up some of the surface that wasn't washed in and, and run it off. Now, where it runs to, well, that's the issue of where, where you applied it. Um, for example, if you've got a hump and hollow system, we actually recommend you limit your spreader so it only does the humps and leaves about two meters on either side of the hollows. Um, so usually about, you know, depending on the hump and hollow, it can be about 16 meters across if it's a, if it's a big one. Um, so, so, you know, you deliberately don't fertilize the hollows because, well, any water that lands there, when the water comes, it's going to run it off. Um, and there is going to be some drift down towards the, the hollows. Um, so if it's a big rainfall event, um, you can get surface runoff, whatever goes off from the surface will take up to about 10% of the nitrogen. If you were talking about leaching, um, one rainfall event doesn't do it. Um, usually what happens is, in, in Victoria in particular, you've got the dry soil that then starts with rain in the autumn break and slowly fills up with water and there's no leaching really to speak of until you get to about the third week of July in most, most seasons where you've had about 200 to 300 cumulative millimetres of rainfall then the soil profile is completely full. Then a, any rainfall on top of that pulses the last bit out the bottom of the soil because it's like a piston action. Um, and what happens is it's the nitrogen that was on the surface of the soil in the autumn that slowly made its way down to the bottom of the soil by, the, uh, by August, September, and then rainfall on top of that can push that nitrogen out the bottom of the soil. Yeah, right. Thanks um, for that, Richard. I think that's all the questions that we have tonight, unless anyone's got any last minute ones. Um, so yeah, thanks again for your presentation. It's very informative and um, a really good uh, recap on last week and then building on some of those ideas and how we can um, apply nitrogen more efficiently. So um, we do have more upcoming webinars, which you will be um, provided with details in the coming weeks um, through emails. So I hope you can join for those in future. We've just got another question. Is there any comment on compost and biological forms of nitrogen? Yeah, look, um, the, the, the bottom line is um, a plant needs to see the nitrogen in either the ammonium or the nitrate form. It really doesn't use, there's some evidence that takes up some organic nitrogen, but not a lot. Um, and it can, plants can take some amino acids up as well. Um, again, not, not a lot. Um, so you've got to remember, all these forms of nitrogen 
are about supplying an element called N. Um, so if you do put on a, a compost or an organic form of nitrogen, it has to break down in the soil and form either ammonium or nitrate for the plant to get substantial use out of it. Um, as I said, some of these products do, do help by applying more sort of amino acids as well, which the plant can use. That doesn't result in the majority of the growth rate that you'd be looking for. Um, so they all help, but at the end of the day, you need to know what the nitrogen content is of the compost or the organic product you're using, because that will determine the response you get. So it's a lot easier, it, it's easier with the bag. Um, it's probably more sustainable if you can get organic forms of nitrogen. Probably, you know, I always say to the dairy farmers, your best source of nitrogen is the effluent in that effluent pond. If you can spread that evenly across the farm, you've done better than fertilizer. So, you know, in an ideal world, we would love to use that. Um, and as long as you know what the nitrogen content is, the end content of it is, then that's the kind of response you'll get. Yeah, thanks, um, Richard. So, yeah, th yeah, sorry. Thanks again for your presentation. Uh, thanks for everyone for attending. And if you can uh, fill out the survey as you exit, that would be um, appreciated. Hope you can join us in the coming weeks for the next um, lot of webinars. Great. Thanks, Gordon.